Santiago de Compostela, the spiritual home of Spain. Pilgrims have been coming here for over a thousand years. Now the cathedral is undergoing the most ambitious restoration ever. From a giant incense burner to priceless statues and crumbling stonework. Not only do they have to prepare for a special feast day in July, but an historic visit from the Pope himself. Can they really complete the facelift in just 10 months? In the northwest of Spain, so the story goes, a hermit followed lights in the sky to where Jesus' disciple, James, was buried. The cathedral built on this spot now hosts over two and a half million visitors a year. In this special holy year, at least 10 million visitors are expected, including the king and queen of Spain. And for the first time in the cathedral's history, the Pope is coming especially to celebrate Holy Year Mass. The pressure is on to get huge swathes of restoration completed in time. At the heart of the restoration, critical repairs to the stonework. Decades of deterioration have taken their toll. The cathedral is crumbling. And architect Javier Alonso's job is to stop the cathedral from falling apart. Presenta diferentes patologías, suciedad orgánica de contaminación, sales también en la piedra, roturas por diversas causas. Se hará eh, será una limpieza eh, superficial, ya que el Papa va a entrar por aquí para que nos encuentre con esta imagen y la retirada de los fragmentos de piedra que son peligrosos, que podrían caer, ¿no? que están fisurados. To prepare for the Pope's tour, other critical works must be carried out to the entranceway, the vaults, and the communion chapel. But it's the Portico della Gloria, the cathedral's masterpiece, which is in most need of attention. Here, a team of conservation specialists led by Concha Thirajano is carrying out an extraordinary three million euro restoration to preserve this medieval treasure. Orchestrating everything is Dean Jose Maria Diaz. As well as conducting several masses a day, he must coordinate the entire restoration project. Es la restauración más importante que se ha llevado a cabo nunca en Galicia. Y esta restauración, que era muy urgente por las humedades y por el deterioro, But first on the Dean's list of vital repairs is the cathedral's prized incense burner, the Botafumero. Watching this 80 kilo metal giant swinging over the heads of the congregation is the highlight of any pilgrim's visit to the cathedral. It takes eight tirabelleros, or rope pullers, to set the Botafumero off in a carefully choreographed ballet. But there's a problem. The nylon rope installed three years ago is too heavy and is not allowing it to swing properly. So, 20 meters up in the rafters, workers are installing a new, specially woven hemp rope. The man in charge is Armando Raposo. He's been working at the cathedral for 60 years and has been head of maintenance for over half a century. He's also the head tirabellero, the chief rope puller. Es el jefe anterior a mí, Jesús García Villar. Este es un obrero de aquí de Jesús. Este es un hermano mío que ya se murió también. Es decir, este se murió, este se murió y este se murió. Y este también. Quedo yo solo. En aquella época quedo yo solo. La mejor cuerda que hubo, que yo conocí, era la de cáñamo. Pero esas, esas cuerdas de cáñamo las hacían a mano. 
aquí tienen uno, pues ya he cambiado una, desde que estoy aquí unas cinco cuerdas. Y así seguimos. The team must also restore the 400-year-old pulley system. Mass cannot be performed while they're working up in the church roof, so they have just two days to get the Botafumero's swing back. In three weeks, the King and Queen of Spain will be coming here to celebrate the feast day of St. James. And then, of course, there's the Pope himself. After watching the Botafumero in action, the Pope will make a special detour to see the Portico de la Gloria. This is the cathedral's crowning masterpiece. It represents the gateway to God and the final judgment. Ahí el mensaje del pórtico es la Jerusalén celeste, donde Cristo nos espera con los brazos abiertos. De ahí los tres arcos. ¿eh? Hay un arco central que es la Jerusalén celeste y dos arcos laterales. El arco de la izquierda es como el alfa, el verbo de Dios entre Adán y Eva y figuras del Antiguo Testamento. Al otro lado es Omega, siempre es en Omega, es el juicio universal. Tiene como centro de la clave el rostro de Cristo y el arcángel San Miguel. Begun in the late 12th century, this stunning three-tiered portico took 20 years to complete. It's considered the greatest example of Romanesque sculpture in the whole of Spain. Now crumbling, the dean has given it priority amongst the cathedral's urgent repairs. Jose Maria Diaz first came to Compostela in 1982. Four years ago, he was elected dean through a secret vote. But now his term is about to come to an end, and he's spending his final year navigating a minefield of bureaucracy. Ha habido muchísimas dificultades, los procedimientos administrativos, etc. y tal. Nos hemos encontrado con muchas demoras, muchos entorpecimientos, muchos permisos legales que tardan en llegar la, la empresa constructora o la empresa restauradora. And while the dean struggles to get sign-off to fix a crumbling cathedral, in the portico, the specialist restorers have begun the first phase of their project. They must map the full extent of the damage to this religious treasure, and they have just 10 months to complete their work. The scaffolding has to come down in time for the papal visit in November. Lead restorer Concha Thirajano is in charge of the team. But with the project only just green lit, there's already a problem. Rumors are circulating that the Galician government now wants the scaffolding dismantled four months earlier than planned. They now want it down in time for the arrival of the King and Queen of Spain in July. This would give them just nine months to complete their work. Santiago de Compostela in northwest Spain. Ambitious restorations are underway for a royal visit in July and the Pope's Mass in November. These will mark the long-anticipated Holy Year celebrations, which only happen when St. James' feast day falls on a Sunday. Beneath the cathedral in the crypt is a silver casket said to contain the relics of St. James, whose tomb was discovered here over a thousand years ago. Aquí lo primero fue la catedral, y de la catedral nació la ciudad. El sepulcro de Santiago fue, fue descubierto hacia el año 830. Se hizo una primera iglesia, de la catedral nació la ciudad de Santiago de Compostela. With the spot where the cathedral now rests identified as the burial ground of St. James, a small Galician outpost was quickly transformed into a holy city. It was one that would rival Rome and even the Holy Land as a major pilgrimage destination for Christians. Over the centuries, it's been built over, under, in, and on top of. Today, it's dominated by showy, largely baroque sculpture, 
which covers 23,000 square meters. With an internal space of 200,000 cubic meters, it's crammed inside and out with ornate sculptures. Here, saints, sinners, the damned, and the divine are all frozen in time. At the center is St. James, the patron saint of Spain. And his feast day has been celebrated every 25th of July for the past 900 years. But the cathedral will only last another 900 years if architect Javier Alonso gets permission from the government to carry out urgent repairs to the facade. In the cathedral library, he runs through his master plan. He's compiled this 2,458-page document over four years. It details all the problems in every crevice, crack, and corner of the cathedral. De los trabajos eh, de estudios documentales, este es el más importante que he desarrollado. Ha sido casi cinco años de trabajo, casi constantes. And thanks to the dictatorship of General Franco in the 20th century, Javier has his work cut out for him. During those dark years, Spain closed its doors to international architects, craftsmen, materials, and ideas. The 1960s and 70s were a particularly low point. In general, all the encintados of this facade, of the Torre Reloj, but of the major part of the cathedral, Eh, son de los años eh, 60, 70, por ahí, cuando era la costumbre hacerlo todo con cemento. Entonces es uno de los problemas añadidos que generan sus sales. ¿eh? Hoy en día como un error, un error muy, muy grave, ¿no? Unlike traditional limestone, modern cement generates salts which leak over time, causing ruptures. It's a mistake that will not be repeated. In another part of the cathedral, clambering over the Botafumero's pulley system 20 meters above the floor of the cathedral is the team of engineers assigned to find that perfect swing. In addition to servicing the Botafumero's mechanism, they're also installing the specially woven hemp rope. As head of maintenance, Armando proudly explains. Estas son algunas. Estas son las que yo le decía. Esta fue la que quité. Ahora, la última. Y esta fue la que puse ahora, ¿no? Es otro, otro material, mucho más flexible. Esta no. In its 800-year history, Bota Fumero has come crashing down at least five times. The most famous occasion was during the visit of Catherine of Aragon in the holy year of 1501, when it flew out of the cathedral window. The team is praying that this won't happen under their tenure. After some much-needed greasing, they're ready to try out the new rope. They watch nervously as their efforts are put to the test. La cuerda rígida de nylon, de fibra, nunca subía a su sitio. Es decir, como la cuerda pesaba mucho más, era mucho más gruesa, era mucho más rígida, como le estoy diciendo, y entonces pesaba, pesa más el botafumero. Por lo tanto, tiramos, tiramos, tiramos y no subía, quedaba a las alturas de la galería, porque la cuerda, en vez de dejarlo subir, lo atraía para abajo. But is the newly installed hemp rope any better? Marcha, pues lo pongo en marcha y vamos elevándolo hasta llegar casi llegar arriba a tocar las bóvedas, como pude ver hoy. No pudo verlo hoy, cuando casi tocó las bóvedas. With the Botafumero back in action and ready for next month's Royal Mass, the team is thrilled with the results.
Meanwhile, back at the Portico de la Gloria, the race to collect all the information the restorers need is well underway. Concha has worked on monuments, including the Cathedral of Seville and the Alhambra Palace, but now she's facing the most complex challenge of her career. She has to coordinate a number of specialist teams. Together, they must work out what's caused the damage to the portico, when it happened, and how to repair it. Under Concha's wing is Dino, coordinator for the entire project. Prima elemento per capire che il portico aveva dei problemi di carattere strutturali si vede proprio da da questo arco. Se vedi qua c'è questa lesione che non ha polvere, per cui eh, è una lesione che si è eh, realizzata in questi ultimi tempi. Evidentemente c'è del movimento. In order to measure the movement, a series of sensors have been placed on the portico. These transmit data to the lab via a computer. At the portico's base station on the second floor, specialist restorer Maria monitors the environmental conditions. Esto, nosotros hacemos un registro de insolación. En qué zonas, en concreto, eh, incide el sol sobre las esculturas? Y normalmente coincide en las zonas que se encuentran en peor estado con las que más tiempo reciben el sol. The team has just received bad news. Orders have come from the government to take the scaffolding down in time for the royal visit. This gives them only 10 days to finish their main tests. The news has come as a blow to the dean, who's not impressed. Pues hubo dudas de si desmontar todo el andamio o parte de él. Hemos preferido pues no desmontarlo todo. It's been decided that most of the portico scaffold will come down but not all of it. Se desmonta todo, se produce la impresión de que se interrumpe la restauración. Y por otro lado, también es importante que todo el mundo tenga constancia de que se está llevando a cabo una restauración importante. La Capilla Sistina, durante varios años, se llevó a cabo con andamios la restauración. Si se hubiera muerto el Papa, pues no se hubieran quitado los andamios. En Roma saben más de andamios que en ningún otro sitio. And as plans for the removal of the scaffolding on the inside are looming, scaffolding on the outside is erected with breathtaking speed. An army of workers has arrived on site for the festival preparations and are carrying out their work like a military operation. Yo me llamo Oscar. Yo me llamo Javier. Estamos montando una estructura después se va a cubrir con una réplica de lo que es la entrada de la catedral. O sea, tú lo vas a ver desde fuera y vas a pensar que estás viendo la catedral. No se ve la estructura. The pair are mounting 10 tons of scaffolding on the main facade of the cathedral. La cadena queda desviada y nos rompe toda la fachada. Dame una puerta, el auto. This will be covered by a false facade loaded with hundreds of fireworks. The fake facade of the cathedral will then seem to burn. Climbing over the rooftops of the cathedral is Rafael Yagas and his pyrotechnics experts. Over the course of this week, they'll set up the fireworks display for the eve of St. James Day. These will be launched from the ground and the roof of the cathedral itself. Estamos montando aquí lo que es fuego de candela romana, efectos, eh, simulacro de incendios y iluminaremos toda la torre. Cada tubito de ese lleva muchos artefactos dentro, ¿vale? Entonces eh, lo que ves ahora no está, no es todo, no está todo colocado. Pues exactamente no te lo sé decir cuánto hay, pero hay bastante, ¿eh? hay mucho. Hay mucho. Esto, esto no es nada para lo que va a haber mañana. 
Scaling the rooftops armed with explosives is a dangerous mission, but protecting the cathedral from danger is paramount. One false move could cause irreparable damage to the medieval monument. At Santiago de Compostela in northwest Spain, restorers, engineers, and events coordinators are working to prepare the cathedral for two VIP visits. The Pope is due in November to celebrate the Holy Year. And on the 25th of July, just five days from now, the King and Queen of Spain will honor St. James. But for Javier, the cathedral's architectural consultant, time is running out, as the Galician government still hasn't greenlit any of his projects. Estamos en el Triforio. Se van a restaurar el revestimiento de las bóvedas y los arcos fajones. También con motivo de la visita papal. The vaults are unlikely to be ready in time for the Pope's visit. And in the clock tower, they only have time for basic safety measures. La torre simplemente sería eh, retirar aquellas piedras que puedan caer. Por una oxidación exagerada, fragmenta las piedras, algunas ya han caído y otras están a punto de caer. Javier's task is not an easy one. Priority has been given to places that the Pope will visit. The Azerbaijiriya facade, the vaults, and the communion chapel. Para antes de la visita del Papa, todo se acometerá como situaciones más, más rápidas, la limpieza hasta la altura de la cornisa de los paramentos, y la restauración, ahora ya los han sacado de aquí, de las esculturas de madera que ocupaban esas cuatro hornacinas. But even with this rapidly approaching event, these works have been paralyzed as the cathedral awaits the government's permission. And ahead of the Pope's visit, the cathedral must welcome Spain's king and queen in just two days' time. As evening descends, the cathedral becomes a hub of activity. Lighting is being installed for the royal arrival. Antonio, the night watchman, does his daily winding inside the clock tower. And Joaquin practices the piece he's preparing for the king and queen. Having been the cathedral's organist for five years, he's become an expert in its dulcet tones. Esto ya suena bastante, ¿eh? Todo el órgano sería esto, pero esto es una locura. Esto sería una auténtica locura. En todo caso, se podría llegar este sonido al final de la tocata. Pero no para empezar. Para empezar, esto, esto debe ser mucho más. La sensación es de gravedad. Le produce la sensación de que se va a caer el templo. Ahora es mucho, pero después no es nada. Después no... Cuando hay mil, mil quinientas personas en la catedral, esto parece que no suena. Te sientes muy pequeño tocando esto. Joaquín will play a toccata by Johann Sebastian Bach. It's a score that holds personal significance for him. En un órgano en el que asistí cuando tenía 13 años al concierto de inauguración de ese instrumento de la mano de mi padre, sin saber, era el primer gran concierto de mi vida al que yo asistía como oyente, sin saber ni por asomo que acabaría tocando eh, en una misa del 25 de julio y con los reyes de España, la obra que abrió ese concierto. Es casi un... cerrar un gigantesco círculo con mi infancia.
Early next morning, pyrotechnic experts are once again scaling the rooftops and towers. They're wiring 5,000 triggers for the fireworks. These will be used to set off 25,000 fireworks during the half-hour show. The fireworks must be placed carefully so they don't damage the stonework. Meanwhile, back down in the portico, it's the final day before the scaffolding is brought down ahead of the royal visit. Concha and her team are now confident they've collected the data required for this stage of the project. Digamos que hemos hecho la fase de, de recogida de información. Ahora viene, tenemos que hacer el diagnóstico a partir de esos datos de redactar el. The thermal and humidity machines will continue to take readings throughout the rest of the year, transmitting them in real time to the labs in Italy. The first phase of the project has been a success. But the cathedral has become a second home to them. It's an emotional event. No deja de ser una obra muy importante, no solo a nivel español, sino a nivel mundial, del románico. Y para un restaurador es como lo más. Y si encima eres de aquí lo has visto desde pequeño, pues, pues es increíble. Nel restauro non c'è mai, vogliamo finire, <ride> perché c'è un dialogo continuo fra l'opera e la persona e quindi è come aprire un, un, un cassetto di, di fotografie o di gioielli dove ci sono cose meravigliose e quindi man mano le, le guardi, le scopri, quindi c'è questa meravigliosa sensazione del vivere nel tempo cioè di entrare in uno spazio, uno spazio in un tempo ormai che non c'è più. But the team must still wait 13 long weeks for the results of their tests to start pouring in. At the end of the day, the scaffolding team are brought in and architect Javier Alonso oversees the dismantling. El Pórtico de la Gloria es como una lección de teología o de catecismo para todos los peregrinos que llegaban. Solo el 10% de Europa sabía leer y por tanto ni había por dónde leer cuando no había la imprenta, quién poseía un códice, etc. Era privilegio de muy pocos, pero por eso la, las catedrales era, y los monasterios eran la Biblia de los pobres, ¿eh? en los capiteles, en los murales, en los frescos, en las esculturas, las lecciones bíblicas y las lecciones de catecismo. Por eso digo que el Pórtico de la Gloria es una lección inicial de, de catecismo para los peregrinos que llegan. With the unsightly scaffolding now out of the way, the cathedral is ready for its first VIP event tomorrow. All eyes are on Rafael Yagas and the pyrotechnic team. But the one thing they're all praying for is that the weather will hold up. Because in Galicia, when it rains, it pours. The eve of St. James Day, celebrations at the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela will begin in less than six hours. In a football field nearby, pyrotechnic experts are making final checks. Once set up, a computer tests the triggers. Tensions are high and patience is wearing thin. Mirá 62 por aquí. Mirá 62 nueve y se ha soltado el inflamador. Le hemos pegado un tirón. Este módulo de aquí, el de los, el de al lado de los 15. Ese, 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 ese. Ábrelo, ábrelo. Eh, a ver, quítate, Frankie. Ahora falla el 7. A ver qué has hecho. Quítate que lo pruebo otra vez. A ver, quita. Vale, el 7 viene, el 9 no. 
Outside the cathedral, the festivities are in full swing, with street performers, musicians and artists all arriving for the celebrations. In the Opera Doiro Square, visitors from all over the globe have gathered in their thousands to secure their place for tonight's spectacle. The final checks are carried out on the fireworks. With all systems now online, Rafael Yagas and his teams have met their deadline and are in high spirits, confident that it will be an unforgettable night for all the right reasons. 11.30 p.m. The weather has held up with clear skies forecast. Over 100,000 people have flooded Obradoiro Square for front row seats. 40,000 watts of music fill the air. 100,000 watts of lights illuminate the cathedral. And 25,000 fireworks are set off with the turn of a key. For Rafael Yagas and his team, it's a brilliant success. Lighting fires to welcome the feast day of St. James is nothing new. It's an annual ritual that's unlikely to be lost as long as the cathedral remains standing. Next morning, Obradoiro Square is filled with crowds eager to catch a glimpse of the King and Queen as they make their way to the cathedral for the most important annual mass. It's the feast day of St. James. For the locals, it's a double celebration as it's also Galicia Day. Politicians, dignitaries and royalty have converged on the square to join the church in an appeal for peace and prosperity. Once inside, the king makes the offering to the apostle. Apostle Santiago, patron de España, quiero pedirte una vez más para España y para todos los españoles. Te ruego nos ayudes a superar las dificultades que afecten a nuestra vida colectiva. The royal visit has been a success. Having just received a major dose of celebrity for the first half of the year, plans are now being put into fifth gear for the second dose. The Pope is coming in just four months' time, and the eyes of the world will turn to Santiago. Finally, permission is through to restore the facade. But now Javier must wait for the government to appoint a contracting company. The project of the restoration integral is approved, but there is no time to execute it before the arrival of the Pope. Entonces lo que sí se hará eh, será una limpieza eh, superficial. Es una pena que todo esto no pueda estar hecho antes porque es una fachada importante y, y pide ser arreglada. Pero al mismo tiempo es también una alegría que por fin haya un proyecto y haya financiación para ejecutar todas sus restauraciones. Inside the communion chapel, another restoration project has been approved. Specialist restorer Rocio Dominek has arrived on site to assess the damage. Okay, these are the sculptures that we have to restore. And they are in a very, very bad state. The humidity from the chapel has made them very soft. 
and they have been attacked by the woodwork. So there are many parts missing, like this hand from San Ambrosio, it's here. As you can see, it came off. We have to make a treatment with an acrylic product that we inject in the wood, so it becomes harder with the time. You have to repeat the treatment like four or five times until it's completely restored the strength of the wood. With the Pope's arrival in just 16 weeks, she's got her work cut out for her. It's very important. He's going to come and pray here. So it has to be everything shiny and brilliant and beautiful. And we have to work as much time as we need. And that can be morning, afternoon, and I think at night <laughs> to, to, to make it happen. And as Rocio prepares herself for some late nights, Javier's stone conservation project is about to take a new twist. Surveyor Duncan Lees has arrived to gather vital data on the Torre del Reloj, the cathedral's clock tower. Unfortunately, there's just one small problem. The weather. In order to determine any structural problems with the clock tower, Duncan is using a laser measurement system to gather the data from the crumbling building. It's far from ideal, the weather, but we've been out in worse. Uh, we're relatively protected here from the, from the rain. If the wind isn't too strong, we should be okay. The scanner itself is waterproof and, and safe. It's just that the rain causes the laser to refract and deflect, and therefore um, you get a lot of noise in the data, as we call it, so a kind of a fuzz of extra points. The scanner's certainly happier in the rain than I am, that's for sure. Yes, Javier. Hola. Javier is keen to know how much the clock tower has subsided. He also wants to get a full 3D map of all the stonework. The weather will have to be nicer <laughs> for us to be able to tell. It's impossible. Yeah. It would be worse. Yeah, today. I think so. After just one setup, the wind has picked up. There's a real danger that the scanner will blow over or even off the top of the tower. Duncan decides to relocate and pray that the storm passes before gathering any more data. Away from the wind, Inside the main chapel, scaffolding is being erected up to the ceiling. This will enable a quick makeover for the vaults. A layer of plaster is being stripped away and painted over. But this has revealed an underlying problem. While Javier gets to grips with the crumbling walls, lead restorer Rossio begins her diagnosis of the statues. Sometimes it's like in a TV show house, they, they have like very strange diseases. They have like strange things on them, like kids paint, we found boat paint on them too. People sometimes do it with their best intention, but it's, they have bad ideas. 
In order to operate on her patients, she must first identify the correct solvent to treat the surface of the statues. It doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't come off either. I'm gonna try with another thing. <laughs> Finally. And this is the rear color without the varnish. You can see it's here. It doesn't seem much, but it makes a difference. Restoration is a very slow process, always. You need a lot of patience <laughs> to work in this. Unfortunately for Rossio, the delay with permissions means she doesn't have a lot of time, just four weeks. And while Rossio gets to grips with disintegrating statues, her colleagues also have less than a month to give the communion chapel altar a complete facelift. Meanwhile, in the clock tower, better weather means that Duncan is finally making headway. What has become glaringly obvious in the few days that we've been working here is, um, is the lack of accurate measurement information that Javier can use within the conservation process. And he needs that information in a, in a third dimension. He needs to see sections and elevations and three-dimensional space. But with all this progress, Javier still has a big problem. The government still hasn't appointed a company to clean the Azabacheria facade, the entranceway the Pope is due to pass through in just three weeks' time. Late October. With the Pope's visit looming, tension is mounting at Santiago de Compostela as workers race round the clock to prepare the cathedral. With just 12 days to go, Javier finally gets permission to start cleaning the Azabacheria facade, where the Pope will enter the cathedral. In double quick time, their cherry picker is in situ and work has started. Tardó la contratación, problemas administrativos. Mete con la mano. Va a retirar las eh, artes de vegetación más aparentes, ¿no? Las los arbustos, hierbas y musgos cuando hay una alta concentración, solo eso, nada más. No es la limpieza definitiva ni la restauración, pero solo un lavado de cara para antes de la venida del mundo. And as cleaning work on the facade speeds up, Workers in the vaults have found a solution to their problem. Otra pasta. Estos ya son pastas especiales que se usan para una hora. De una hora lo que tienes que hacer es trabajarla rápido para que no te se quede nada más. Vale. Bien, o sea que no es problema el esperar. No, no, no. Es simplemente no. el problema que, que, que haya horas para trabajar. Nada más. Vale, Pero, vale. Bien. La pasta esta es de una hora. Ok. Ya viene en el saco. Sí, es que el... La base de, del mortero está peor de lo que pensábamos, pero al mismo tiempo tenemos mucha prisa para acabar en plazo. Entonces, a ver si mañana, a partir de mañana, hay más gente trabajando. But Javier's night is not over yet. There's one more vault that needs attention. But in order to reach it, the team must move the massive chandelier hanging in the main transept. So they call in head of maintenance, Armando. El peligro que lleva el mover esa lámpara. Esa lámpara tiene 3.000 piezas de cristal de roca y tiene 3 metros de diámetro por 5 de alto. Y entonces cualquier movimiento que tenga un poco raro puede moverse y romper las, los brazos y hacer un estropicio en la lámpara. After a long night, the team successfully maneuver the priceless chandelier out of the way. 
The next morning, Javier meets Duncan to get the results he's been waiting for, the scan measurements of the clock tower. You can see that all of the stones yeah. are clear. You can see all of the joints in the mm. stonework here. And where, the, where there's gaps in the scan data, it's because there's gaps in the stonework as well. Incredible. Genius. For the very first time, Javier has accurate measurements for the clock tower, 3D plans that are vital before commencing his urgent restoration project. But crucially, the scan reveals that the tower has subsided. The total tilt is 121 millimeters. Javier will have to keep an eye on this over the coming years. By now, all the studies of this tower have been only uh, historical or statistical studies. In fact, by now, it's the first time that it's a, a drawing mm. of this part of the building. It's the day before the Pope's visit. And in the communion chapel, the altar is freshly gilded and ready for the statues that Rossio has painstakingly restored to be brought home. With the saints safely restored to their pedestals, the dean could not be happier. Estamos muy contentos. Esta empresa de la restauración ha llevado a cabo una obra admirable y de esta manera, pues, cuando el Papa entre aquí y se encontrará con una capilla digna y bellamente restaurada con esta ocasión. The fresh makeover for the communion chapel, the vaults, and the Azabacheria facade has renewed Javier's hope for the cathedral's restoration. La zabacheria es un lavado de cara, pero ahora se va a iniciar la restauración a fondo. Estamos encantados de esta oportunidad y esperamos estar a la altura del reto que, que supone. Outside the cathedral, there's a buzz of activity. The next morning, on Obradoiro Square, the stage has been set for mass. and people have converged from around the world to support the Pope on his first visit to Santiago. For the Dean, for Javier, and for the rest of the team, it's another job successfully completed, at least for this year. The Catedral is an obra maestra from many points of view. We're committed to sumarnos us to the spirit la gente que ha construido, que ha ido construyendo la catedral a lo largo del tiempo. For Rocio, it's the job of a lifetime. For a restorer, it's like the best thing you can do. This work is like our biggest job to this day, and we're really happy about that. For Amando, it's a proud moment. Llevo aquí unos 50 y pico de años. Y todos estamos encantados. ¿Dónde mejor se va a estar que en el medio de un cabildo de la Catedral de Santiago? En ningún sitio, me parece. For Jose Maria, the papal visit is the high point of his tenure as dean of the cathedral. 
que la venida del Papa a un lugar católico como esto consagra su importancia y consagra su espiritualidad. Estoy convencido de que marca, diríamos con letras de oro, el año santo de 2010. Es buen final. It's an engineering marvel, one of the most famous bits of steelwork in the world. But someone decided to turn Sydney Harbour Bridge into a giant picnic spot. How could they possibly do it without bringing an entire city to a standstill? The bridge itself is the heart. The situations that happen on the bridge that are out of your control. And it all had to happen to a deadline. Did they have any idea what they were taking on? It's pretty spectacular. It doesn't just say Sydney, but Australia too. A national monument, a world icon, but also a vital part of this city's transport network. The bridge is used to being roped in as an awesome backdrop when it's New Year party time. Sydney's reputation is intact as the New Year's Eve capital of the world. But then came a plan to put the bridge itself centre stage. They call it breakfast on the bridge. But they're not just picnicking on a bypass. On October the 10th, 6,000 people showed up to eat breakfast on the world's most extraordinary picnic table. Making this happen took many months, with dedicated task forces working frantically behind the scenes. And exactly how they managed it is an extraordinary story. It's a huge undertaking, isn't it? And I'd never expected to see real grass. <laughs> I expected artificial grass, I can't believe it. I think the bridge defines Sydney. It, there's many of us who believe that you know, if the bridge didn't exist, it'd be a much different city. It's bringing the family together, having a day out, enjoying breakfast in the rain. <laughs> Doesn't get any better, really, does it? It's fantastic, thanks guys. Typical of the bridge, Sydney, but bum. <laughs> the kids, just the atmosphere. Who cares if it rains? It can rain as much as it wants. Locals call it the coat hanger. This bridge linking central Sydney with the city's north shore. It's the world's widest long span bridge. It's tallest steel arched bridge and carries more than 160,000 vehicles and almost 400 trains every day. Five million commuters cross it each week. Without the bridge, the whole city would grind to a halt. Everyone in Sydney knows that, so to party on the bridge is, if you like, their way of saying thank you. Well, all of my life I've uh, known it and I grabbed the opportunity, it's an icon, it's part of our lives, and I guess it's one of those things that every Sydney Siders would come and try and do. It represents connection between people, letting people connect with each other, um, exactly what's happening over here. I couldn't think of a, a better place to be having um, an occasion like this. The highlight of Sydney's food festival, known as Crave. Breakfast on the bridge has been a staggering success. Even the rain couldn't dampen their spirits. Now it's time to clean up. And very soon, the organizers can think about relaxing.
will be a couple of hours early. We'll follow three task forces, charged with getting the bridge into shape before the October deadline. Preparing for the picnic and giving the 78-year-old structure a major facelift too. With just 10 months to complete the work, it's a monumental challenge. The Transport Management Centre, staffed by Steve and Tom, has to keep traffic running smoothly, 24-7. If something happens on the Sydney Harbour Bridge, then it affects the whole of Sydney. That's what happens. Their events team is in charge of planning the picnic. Breakfast on the bridge may seem like a simple idea, but to actually get this event up and running and everything on the bridge is huge. On bridge renewal and painting, Merco from the Road Transport Authority, or RTA. It's not I'm only that somebody will say, oh, it's very easy, it's only going and find it. It's not only finding, it's a lot to involve. And Merco's son, Joe. Maintenance on the bridge is a massive job. And on rail maintenance, Railcorp's Nathan makes sure the overhead power cables run safely, rain or shine, whatever the hazards. Uh, it's hard to get access to the track to do any actual work. So as the deadline approaches, each team needs a game plan to get their tasks finished, with the bridge still up and running. The Bridges Transport Management Centre, or TMC, coordinates everything from rush hour lane changes to emergency rescue work. This year, they'll also move into a new state-of-the-art control room and orchestrate various planned closures, including the big breakfast in October. And they have to do it without compromising safety. Railcorp looks after all the trains which use the bridge. Before October, they need to put in new overhead cables to power brand new rolling stock, replace the timber decking with concrete, and generally keep the railway up to scratch. And the permanent team of painters must strip and repaint 10,000 square meters of the bridge without polluting the harbor below them. No one said it would be easy. So are they up to this monumental challenge? Rush hour on the Sydney Harbor Bridge and thousands of people prepare to cross the bridge by train. Behind the scenes, the 300 staff who work for Railcorp. This year, they've planned four two-day shutdowns, known as possessions. These will ensure that almost 3,000 trains a week can continue to cross the bridge safely and will allow critical repairs to the structure, wiring, cable and track. For Nathan Hofmeister, chief engineer for overhead power cables, and his colleague Hassan, these closures are a finely honed mission. During this possession, they have just 48 hours to replace two main overhead power structure points, and there's no room for error. We've got to disconnect both structures and the, replace them in the same spot. Yep. And why is our priority? for Monday morning to get ready. Yep. The second one's going to be Risto's work. We've got to disconnect the spam wires. Okay. The plan, of course, is to stick to the timetable like clockwork. Whether they do it or not is another question. As Sydney grew into one of Australia's greatest cities, something rapidly became clear. There had to be a way of spanning the harbour, linking the city centre with the North Shore. Erasmus Darwin, grandfather of the famous naturalist Charles Darwin suggested a bridge in 1791. No one listened. Ferries appeared in 1830. Within 50 years, they were already struggling to cope. Perhaps old Mr. Darwin had been right all along. Then in 1891, John Bradfield joined the New South Wales Department of Public Works. And he's known to this day as the father of the bridge. Under the bridge, Mirko and his team are gearing up for their own challenge. 60-year-old Mirko Saravac has 17 years' experience as a specialist bridge painter. Do a good job. Number one crewmate. 
Mirko supervises the 10-man team that will be painting 10,000 square meters of the bridge this year in four stages. A key member of Mirko's team is Joe, his 31-year-old son. He's been working here for 10 years already. That inspires me a lot, working on the Harbour Bridge and being an, an icon, like I said, I like, really enjoy it. Of course I'm proud of my dad working here with me because, you know, the father and son team gives me the right advice most of the times. <laughs> and, yeah, coming to work together, I'm proud, of course. Like everyone who works on the Sydney Harbour Bridge, they're on a tight deadline. But for Mirko and his team, this looks more like a mission to Mars than a paint job. Painting makes it sound much too easy. What they do is a critical part of the maintenance regime. They have to strip the bridge of many layers of old, highly toxic, lead-based paint. And replace it with new, eco-friendly paint that will last 25 years. First, they need to put up sealed painting stages down below. This takes 10 days, but we'll make sure the paint doesn't go where it shouldn't. Zero hour. Everyone must don a special safety suit, complete with breathing apparatus, to protect from poisonous fumes. Blasting it, man. Did you put all the slings? On the hoses, whenever you're ready to blast, yeah. let me know. Yeah. I'll let you know if you're ready. Yeah. Okay. And as the curtains are raised so that work can begin, Mirko and his supervisor, Waruna, are on full alert. We put a double, uh, yeah. double curtains in yeah. there. They protect the noise yeah. and yeah. protect, in case if you make one damage, yeah. the second one, they protect the, yeah. any yeah. emission that come in here. I don't want any emissions, right? No, 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 definitely not. I don't want not. any emissions here. No, right? Make sure not. that everything is 100% safe, yes. right? Yeah. The team certainly has their work cut out. Beginning at the south pylon by the water's edge, they'll move slowly towards the southwest end of the bridge. But this world-famous structure could have ended up looking very different. In 1903, Norman Self submitted a winning design that relied on an artificial island built out into the harbour. But a change in government meant that the project was dropped until the end of World War I. A new competition in 1921 brought entries from all over the world. The bridge eventually combined the design concepts of several different people, but the most important was attributed to John Bradfield. After seeing New York's Hellgate Arch, he insisted on an arched rather than a cantilever or horizontally projected bridge. It would look better and save money. English firm Dorman Long and Company won the prestigious building contract. The bridge opened in 1932. Total cost, 10 million pounds. And so traffic's been flowing here for 78 years. Not always smoothly. Here we have a westbound incident, Carl Expressway before the tunnel, westbound incident two. There's roadworks, southbound incidents different areas of the bridge. Steve Howey has been working at the Transport Management Centre, or TMC, for 32 years. The one thing about it, with a peak hour, it goes really quick because there are so many things happening. As you come in early in the morning, you start early, you get your cup of coffee, you sit down and let's go. It's a tough job with an average of five to 10 incidents a day. For me to do my job, to the best of my ability, I have to remain calm. The situations that happen on the bridge that are out of your control, so you, you can just best deal with what's around. Tom's a supervisor, sharing the heavy workload. Four, five and six are out. <coughs> Working closely with him, interacting with him all the time. We've got the, all the cameras up there on the bridge, which I can watch and which he can watch. If any incident happens, he alerts me of it straight away because we know what a major impact it can have. 
on the rest of the Sydney Road network. And I'm working closer with him. And if there's anything that he needs that he hasn't got at hand, any other resource that I can supply, like a helicopter if it was possible, um, then I can do that to assist. Even a minor incident can have a big knock-on effect. If something happens on the Sydney Harbour Bridge, then it affects the whole of Sydney. That's what happens. It has the potential to, to impact all of Sydney because it's such a critical crossing port. We've only got about seven crossing points of the whole of the, the, whole of the harbour. Tom has two jobs on his plate. Alongside day-to-day -day traffic management, they're all about to move to a new state-of-the-art HQ. They need to make the move with minimum traffic disruption and, always, maximum safety. What we've got to do is we make sure that the other room is, first of all, make sure that it's completed. Um, the week before we move, myself and another Chief Traffic Controller will actually test all the computer programs to make sure they work, to make sure that they're all up and running and they can do everything that we need to do. Uh, we do that on every separate console to make sure that they work. However, you won't know if they all work under full load when every console is being operated at the same time. They can't afford to get it wrong. As Tom looks to the future, at midnight, the Railcorp team are waiting for the final day's train to depart so they can shut the line down, take possession. It's going to be a long night. OK, right to take possession of the up and down shore lines between North Sydney and Central. This section is clear of rail traffic. Hello, trouble. OK, so on authority, 627 stroke 10, I've got clearance to remove supply between Argyle and Waverton. The switch is thrown, but there's already a problem. They've got a train stuck in a section. They're not going to grant us possession on time. Nathan and his team are behind schedule before they've even started. So how are they going to hit their deadline? Midnight on the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and urgent work on the train lines is off to a slow start. They've only got 48 hours to do all the work they need. The clock's ticking. Nathan has to make some tough decisions. We're a bit behind. We're going to have to prioritise our work and attack our critical ones on the down track. Nathan has to come up with plan B. Make sure we get done. There's two left on the main. If we don't complete our three critical locations, we won't be able to run wire in the following possession. If we don't get that reconnected by tomorrow afternoon, trains won't be able to run Monday morning. It's too late to reverse some of the work they've already begun. So finishing the wiring job becomes top priority. All the rivets have been taken out of the ones we've got to do. And as Nathan and his team wrestle with their problem, the traffic management team are also having a busy night. We've also got works on the Sydney Harbour Bridge tonight, where there's three lanes of the eight lanes closed on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. That won't happen, I think, until about 11 o'clock. And while Tom plans future roadworks closures, Steve's concerned with the here and now. Now, I've decided to do a lane change to give an extra lane of traffic from the city to the north. Now, we really want traffic to get in there as quick as possible because the more it stays empty, the more dangerous it is. And this will funnel people up into that Lane, north, they're like sheep. Uh, as soon as one goes, the rest tend to follow. Yeah, copy that, Tango 5. His colleague Ian hears the immediate effect of the successful lane change. Hear the speed of the traffic? It's pumping. Ian Matthews mans the TMC's office on the bridge. It's like the blood. The bridge itself is the heart. With all these blockages, they're not going to work. So we're going to get the blood pumping again. Tom and Steve rely on him to keep things moving on the ground. People want to move. Nobody wants to sit still driving in their car. If I can do a little bit to keep it moving, that's me. That's what I want. And while traffic flows across the bridge, the TMC's Brandon McNally is getting his head around breakfast on the bridge. Breakfast on the bridge may seem like a simple idea, but to actually get this event up and running and everything on the bridge is huge. 
Brandon's worried about everything from toilets and garbage to the fleet of trucks bringing grass to cover the bridge in turf. They need to learn from last year's mistakes. Uh, if it does come down to from High Street up, um, up the north. The Australian traffic network's chopper is an eye in the sky, constantly watching the traffic flow. I, I was saying it's very quiet, mate, heading, I'm um, just looking at the bridge approaches out of, uh, out of the city. You have to keep a close eye on it because Sydney traffic in the matter of minutes can just change. So uh, it's, it's very important that you stay focused and very important that we constantly, constantly um, update on what's happening around town. Linda said when we're flying up in the air, we get the key advantage and the bird's eye view of having a look at the whole scope of, of what's happening in Sydney's traffic. <laughs> Good evening, it's Vic LaRusso and it's a great run out of the city tonight if you're accessing the Harbour Bridge, no problem to the Western Distributor, all the way into North Sydney or if you're heading into the city too from the North Shore, the freeway approaches for the main deck of the Harbour Bridge moving well and a good run for military roads. The chopper is a vital part of today's complex traffic plan. 70 years ago, no one dreamed there'd be this much traffic crossing the bridge. In 1934, exactly 16,988 vehicles used the bridge, paying £619. Now, ten times as many cars cross every day, raising around half a million Australian dollars daily. It's just as well the original design can cope with the modern payload. Bridge historian Caroline McInnes and surveyor Duncan Lees want to explore the secrets of bridge construction using brand new technology. So Duncan, you've got some modern survey equipment here. I guess it's very different from the uh, equipment that was used as part of the original bridge construction. Fundamentally, things really haven't changed that much. These days, everything is in one box and the laser scanner that I've, you, that I've got here enables us to do the same sort of job that they did. And I think the big difference is that we can collect much more information in a much shorter space of time, something that they'd have probably envied on a project like this. In the 1920s, the original surveyors had to rely on less high-tech methods. The survey was done by two teams, the British team and the Australian team. Any, any friction in that, I wonder? It was a very good process, very sound, and it came together. They had to be absolutely precise for yeah. the bridge to be built accurately. Um, so the two teams did the, their own surveys and then compared notes. Today, Duncan plans to scan the bridge using a laser, recording tens of thousands of survey measurement points per second. His gear can do in weeks what would have taken the original surveyors months. It is both horizontally and vertically true. The laser rotates around the top here and sends out a laser beam which when it hits the surface reflects back to the instrument. As Duncan's laser starts to pick up survey points accurate to within six millimetres, Mirko and his son Joe are approaching the central arch. How's things going down on the steel platform? Is that uh, steel platform is going very good. Uh, we have a bit of problem with the weather and that, but uh, I've said that it's going uh, quite very well. Yeah, the ducting is good. Ducting is uh, work uh, excellent. That's good. With the spraying, we do today a bit of spraying over there, and I reckon maybe tomorrow we finish all spraying on the steel platform. The guys call my dad the owner of the bridge because it's like it's his bridge, and he just wants to see the best for the Harbour Bridge. So it's a bit of a joke going around that he's the owner of the bridge because he's so passionate about working here. For Joe, it's far more than just a job of work. Deadlines are like keeping up with the painters because it all revolves around painting the Harbour Bridge. And if we're lagging behind in the ducting, that slows them down and we don't want that. While father and son move slowly on, Steve and the traffic team is dreaming of his new control room. Well, we've been up here now for about nine months in a rather cramped space. We're looking forward to the new cameras that we're going to have, our new LED screens, the new wall, which has been expanded and we'll have more um, screens on it. From time to time, they need all the help they can get. I remember one time when I was over on the bridge, it was a really bad stormy night. It rained that heavily that we had 
in a space of an hour, we had 78 breakdowns. And that was just on the Harbour Bridge. Cars were stopped everywhere, it was like a parking lot. Ian's worst nightmare was the time a crane got stuck. For Supervisor Tony, an electrical fire on a train stopped in the middle of the bridge. And for the boss, Phil Akers. The accidents on the bridge, unfortunately, are a, um, an ongoing occurrence. Normally, it's, it's your, your rear ender type accident because people aren't paying enough focus on the road. Um, and it's quite common with people traveling over a, um, an icon such as the Harbour Bridge, they're looking around and looking at the structure themselves, which is not a good thing to do when you're actually traveling on a, uh, a major piece of road. Accidents happen, but it's the TMC's job to cope in every crisis. With tow trucks and other emergency vehicles, they also get information to the public as fast as they can. Even with their best efforts, there are an average of 50 incidents per week. Every one has to be handled swiftly and decisively. The city is depending on it. Without us at the TMC, I'm certain that traffic wouldn't flow as efficiently as what it does in Sydney. This is the best job I've ever had in my life. It's really because you can actually have an impact straight away on traffic. Um, yes, it can be very stressful. Yes, it can be frustrating because sometimes you physically can't remove if it's a broken down truck or if it's a smashed truck. But I can certainly have that coordination role and assist anybody out in the field that can do it. And what happens is you get a result every day. And as Tom and Steve patrol the bridge virtually, Brandon's on the prowl and thinking about breakfast on the bridge. Now it looks like there's nowhere for the trucks carrying the turf to turn. A simple problem which could bring the whole plan crashing down. Winter in Sydney and breakfast on the bridge is coming up in less than two months' time. With 10,000 square metres to be painted. Urgent work on the train lines underway and a major upheaval as the traffic managers move house. Three teams are racing to meet the looming deadline. But the TMC's events coordinator, Brandon, is running out of time. He and colleague Aaron are on a recce. They need to make sure that 11,000 square meters of grass, 50 toilets and 16 flower pots can get onto the bridge fast. Our choke point last year was around this point. Yeah. Yep. So hopefully we can alleviate this year with bringing the trucks right down, dropping off at their certain locations. Once they're empty, they'll head down here off the bridge. Southern end. They're in for a long morning. I'm sure if we increase numbers, we're going to have to put more grass on there. What's your thoughts on that? Depending on how many more numbers you want to get, um, yeah, you, you certainly increased it a little bit either side, I'd say. Getting them off the bridge is keeping As Brandon and his colleague get to grips with turfing the bridge, they're standing at its centre. Yeah, so of, of three-dimensional points. And as Caroline and Duncan are discovering, this engineering milestone, with an arch span of 503 metres and a total length of 1,149 metres, was groundbreaking in a number of ways. At the time, the bridge was the greatest steel arch bridge in the world right. through the combination of its span, its width and its load-bearing capacity. It must be hugely uh, demanding of resources, both in terms of the sort of materials involved, but also the number of people working on it. Sure, it was a, a massive project and a great employer of um, workers, particularly during the Depression, because, of course, the bridge started to be constructed um, after the contract was signed in 1924, and it took eight years to completion in 1932. No one had built anything like it before. I think you get a much more understanding of how huge the thing is being here rather than actually on the bridge itself. What sort of quantities of materials are in the bridge then? There's 52,800 tonnes of steel in the arch and the approach spans. You also have the tonnes of concrete that we used for the pylons. They're faced with granite. The builders also use their own pioneering technology, creeper cranes. 
These were massive cranes that were designed specially, um, built and tested in England before mm -hmm. they were brought out to Australia. And they were actually five cranes in one. They weighed 600 tonnes right. and they were supported on an undercarriage, which was a travelling undercarriage with 16 wheels. And if you can imagine, they, start, they were placed on the top cord of the bridge and then they moved out slowly as each panel was built. The largest of the cranes could hoist a staggering 120 tonnes. The arch alone weighed over 39,000 tonnes and took two years to complete. Down below, Mirko and his team are ready to blast. All right, yeah, everyone's right to go, so uh, just plug everyone in, please. Why are you going on the other side? All the face. No, 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 finish inside there. Because we got the cover because they blast there and they, then we get the stuck. Finish it one, all around. All around? Yeah. yeah. They're on their third section and they need to finish blasting the old lead base paint in time for inspection. And if they don't pass, they can't paint. Make sure you do all around, finish. When you do inside and the top and board at the same time. Thank you. What we do now, we do do inspection one o'clock. And after inspection, we check, make sure it's all done 100% clean blasting. If there's any spot that had to be reblasted, we touch up and then we start the spraying. Where you blast on the top? I'll blast the side, this side is finished, and the inside uh, half is finished, and the top is half is finished. I'll have to do it from the other side. Yeah, good. Whether it's Mirko's keen eye or his shouting, the work is finally done. All spick and span for this inspection. In the same spot. You're making the photo 71. The team's work passes inspection with flying colours. We've just had a inspection of the, the blasting from today. Uh, the class we try to achieve here is two and a half class blast. The boys have achieved that. There's a couple of little touch-ups we need to do as per usual. The boys will be in here for about another five, ten minutes touching up the blasting and our painters will come in and put to the first cape primer. It's time to paint. At four days per coat for four coats, using high-tech paint guaranteed for 25 years, this will take 16 days. It looks as though they might just finish in time. Also on time, the TMC. On the night of the move, we have two shifts working. We have one working in our temporary room that we're in now, and then we have another shift working downstairs. And when we know that every, when we're confident that everything's going to be working, then we'll just shut down the room upstairs. Sounds simple, but there's plenty that could go wrong. There are a number of concerns for us. Um, the accommodation of the people in the, in the cramped quarters, um, ensuring all the systems work smoothly first time up, because even though we'll be taking a staged approach and moving half of our people at a time, it's still a requirement that, that the systems are basically on a seamless arrangement for us. They're going to work a double shift, one team manning the desks whilst a second one shifts and tests the equipment. Then they'll switch over to the new room. It has to go like clockwork. It might be half past five time to change over shifts. You could have three or five lanes shut on the Harbour Ridge. You could have chaos everywhere. The person comes in, you tell them exactly what's happening. They say, okay, go home, goodbye. You know the person that's coming here is gonna take over and it'll run just the same as when you were there. Steve and the team are all set. But on the bridge, Duncan has run into a problem. The biggest problem here we have is of health and safety issues. We can't stand in the roadway, we can't stand on the cycle path, so we're stuck, we're limited to information that we can get from the walkway. He has to set the scanner with its working range of 150 to 200 metres to scan every 10 metres so that the scans can combine to show the bigger picture. 
And as it does its work, Duncan and Caroline survey the bridge visually. When we're down at a distance, the bridge looks deceptively simple, I think. You know, beautiful, curving shape, very sinuous. But when you're up close, there's so much more uh, that you can't see from down there. All of the different crisscross steels and the, and the rivets and the bolts, and you can clearly see that all of the elements are just are straight pieces. Paradoxically, although the bridge is arched, every piece of steel in it is straight. The 28 panels were pieced together like a giant model. If you were to break it down into component pieces, I wonder how many different components there are or whether each individual bit is like a bespoke piece that's only, only on the bridge once, if you like. Look, they were certainly built as component sections, but, um, you know, with the arch itself, there are 14 equivalent sections on each side, so there'd be two pairs. 14 panels on each side of the harbour, weighing 28,000 tonnes each, were held back by 128 thick steel cables. These ran back into U-shaped tunnels cut into solid rock and lined in concrete. The tension on either side of the arch was only relieved when the two sides met. Now, were they always put in at the same time or, or no, did it alternate? No, in fact, um, the bridge was built um, inequally. It started on the southern side right. and they built it quite a long way out before they started the northern side. And it, the first piece um, put in was the most difficult. So um, they tested one side right. to get that right and then worked off that basis on the other side. But there was a lot of scepticism okay. about, you know, their ability to get this bridge to meet in the middle at the time. Okay. So it was reported in the paper quite frequently. People were asking the question, will it come together? Will it actually meet? To celebrate this extraordinary event, they hung the Union Jack on one of the creeper cranes and the Australian flag on the other. But the triumph came at a heavy price. Many of the workers went deaf during the eight-year process and 16 men lost their lives. One man actually survived to fall to the water 170 feet, Victor Roy Kelly, a boiler maker. That's extraordinary. It, it's really incredible. Um, he survived apparently because he was a diver and he knew how to hit the water, but even so, it um, was pretty remarkable. But that's history. Today brings a whole new set of problems. Bad weather has grounded the traffic chopper. And Nathan, refurbishing the rail line, has discovered something nasty. While battling the wind, the team has found damaged timber decking. Put in decades ago, wind and weather constantly take their toll on the timber sections. And this timber here, the water's slowly starting to get into it, start, slowly starting to cause the rot. And replacing the timber, it's, it's a bit of a logistical effort. We need to have the rail closure, we need to have the power out, and we've got to have the area excluded because when they replace a section of the timber, they have to lift out the panel, which then leaves a hole in the deck, which uh, causes an obvious safety issue. It's dangerous. But the team has an answer. Why not encase the timber in concrete? It sounds simple enough, but high winds will make this a tricky job. And Nathan's not the only person battling the elements. Bad weather and an unforeseen technical hitch means that Mirko and his team of painters are also behind schedule. Overseer Waruna is worried. So make sure that that curtain is out. Yep. And uh, make sure that the, the two sides and the other side is secure properly, right? Yep. yep. And uh, make sure that everything is okay. Yep. We need to start right straight away yep, no before worries. the wind picks up, right? No. Otherwise, we are going to lose another day. It can be a very windy day, which uh, people can't work on the uh, platform. Their deadline means they have to start painting today. There's only one problem. With high winds raging, they've had to stop work. Four a.m. on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Painters, traffic controllers, 
and rail engineers have less than one month to go before the giant celebration, breakfast on the bridge. But thanks to bad weather, both the painters and the rail engineers are behind schedule. Nathan and his team are racing to complete a long list of repairs during a two-day rail shutdown. They're trying to finish a structural repair, as well as replacing three large steel stanchions, which have not been touched since the bridge was built. Already behind schedule from earlier delays, Nathan's team are losing even more ground. Uh, currently we're experiencing some high winds out on the bridge. Uh, I've had reports of up to about 50 knots. Um, safety is our first priority with all our work, comes before our production. Uh, we're going to have to attack our critical tasks only and pick up the rest of the work uh, later on during some nighttime possessions. Luckily, they're in for a reprieve. You gotta get that way more. The wind has died down quite a lot. Uh, we can work in the weather at the moment. So we'll try to get as much as we can done before they pick up again, if they do. They need to make the most of this window. With the cold weather, the steel contracts, and because we've got to slide the bridge over the leg, it's just come in tight. So it's just a bit tight on it, but they've got one end in and they've got a bolt in that end, so it's pivoting on that end and it's just dropping into place now. There's one more critical item to go. This is our second last critical item. Against all the odds, they've finished. Uh, the guys behind me are putting up the final piece of critical steel work we need. Uh, it's quite a milestone for us. It allows this stage to complete. We've worked long and hard through many delays. And we're all quite happy to finally work through it all. Mirko and his team are also feeling jubilant. With the arrival of spring, work has speeded up. And a week before deadline, they're painting their final section. This is, is a first coat a primer. We had to re apply as soon as we finished the blasting. We had to apply straight away because we get a, if we got moisture in the air, that whatever job we do, there'd be no quality. This is a final full coat. And it's calling the point is now, it's see they have a bridge still grey. That's a special night for see they have a bridge. After priming the area, they're ready to start applying undercoats two and three before the bridge's special top coat known, yes, as Harbour Bridge Grey. Ahead of their final inspection for the year, Mirko gets out his tools. We go down and touch up. That's all the bit. You can see over there a bit, and the rest is very good. Yeah, put me inside there a little bit. That's it. That's 418, that's very good and very happy. 399, that's excellent. we done today uh, spraying final coat, and I just done an inspection. That's very good, they've done a very good job, nice and smooth. Very happy with the boys, very happy, they've done a very good job. All right, thank you, you've done a good job, you've done a very good job. No Jeffrey, done a very good job. Oh, I don't mind what they call me. I still do my job. With rail renewal and paintwork completed, the pressure is now on at the traffic management center. Their control room move, planned for six months, was executed like clockwork in the dead of night. So was it all worth it? The advantage of the new place is it's world-leading technology. 
We've got old new computer systems, they're a lot faster. We've got new video wall, we'll have new screens. Things will just be able to be done a lot quicker, a lot faster, be very efficient. We've just moved down into our new office and it's fantastic. But with the HQ move followed swiftly by breakfast on the bridge, have they bitten off more than they can chew? Breakfast on the bridge is coming up in a few days and there's quite a lot to be done um, to have it all in place. Meanwhile, at the bridge's famous foundations, Duncan will take his final measurements. So Duncan, what are you capturing from this angle? This is one of the very important setups for the scanner really because it's only from here that we can see elements on the top of the decking of the bridge and also the underside of the bridge. Combining a total of 50 separate scans, each from a different location, Duncan will be able to produce a 3D model which can highlight any of the bridge's features close up. It'll help with ongoing maintenance, but his work has proved that the bridge, designed in an era before computers, is equal to anything that today's technology can produce. And it all started here. We're, we're really looking at a key component to the bridge yes. here. If, if this wasn't accurately positioned and wasn't um, carefully constructed, then none of the rest of the bridge, bridge would have worked. No, that's right. And, you know, any inaccuracy here would have compounded probably over the length of the bridge. First, the foundations and arch, the bridge's joint supports, were completed. Then workers began to construct the rest of the bridge. And the sense you get here as, as you get closer is the thousands of rivets that are, that are in position. Does anyone come up with a, with a figure as to how many there actually are in the bridge? Look, as close as they could estimate, it's about six million rivets, and that's three and a half thousand kilos of weight. 6,000 hungry visitors about to pour onto the bridge aren't coming to see rivets. They'll want their breakfast. TMC from India Floor, can you let us know uh, when we're right to lift this one over? So, well, we've just got to make sure that all the turf gets down by 5am. Uh, once we've got it all down by 5, we've got to get all those trucks out of there so we can then bump in all the, all the other infrastructure that's actually sitting on top of the grass. There's still a lot to go, even though when you think you're done, you've got the turf on the bridge. It's still early in the night, so it's going to be a, a long night. And the clock is ticking. As Brandon's work gets underway inside the bridge, TMC colleague Ian is buoyant. Whenever travelling into the city, I point out to my son uh, the Harbour Bridge, and um, that's my office. And I, I really feel, I really feel special then. And that's that's all it takes, you know. This that keeps me in this job more than probably than anything. The trucks have managed to deliver on time, and it's now over to the ground staff. I'm nervous at the moment. Once the uh, grass is fully down and people are walking under the bridge, I should. Uh, calm down a little, get myself um, a bit of loaf of bread from uh, on the bridge and sit down and have something to eat for breakfast. Let's hope they're ready, because the guests are arriving. Overnight, Brandon and his crew have managed to divert traffic, turf the bridge, set up 50 toilets and dozens of waste bins. It's been a giant team effort. while Vic watches from high up. 
At their new headquarters, Tom and Steve are keeping an eagle eye on the roads. People walk over it, people walk under it, people just want to do everything on the Harbour Bridge. I love everything about my job. I get to work on the Harbour Bridge on events when everybody else is trying to get tickets to get onto it. We, we celebrate our bridge. Other parts of the world, they may have the Champs de Lys, eh? we've got the Sydney Harbour Bridge. We're in love with this bridge. Yeah. It's one of the best things ever happened in this planet. Yeah. Harbour Bridge means a lot to me and a lot to my wife, I suppose, because I proposed underneath the Harbour Bridge four months ago. And we had a wedding three weeks ago right underneath the Harbour Bridge as well. I just think it's a symbol of how amazing Sydney is and how beautiful the harbour is. It's our identity. Typical of the bridge, Sydney went well. <laughs> <laughs> In Shanghai, a small army has less than one year to complete a forty billion dollar challenge. The challenges include tunneling less than two meters away from a busy subway line, building and operating China's largest tunneling machine, moving a 1,000 ton bridge. So it's a quite mission impossible, but we have to do it. But can they really do it? Shanghai 2010, the Bund, or China's Wall Street. 150 years ago, this was home to a multinational banking powerhouse that spawned the likes of HSBC and Standard Chartered. Such was the Bund's success that it produced an area still famous today for its architecture and for its decadence. But after the communist revolution in 1949, the historic quarter was left to decay for over 50 years, until Shanghai won the bid to host the World Expo. <laughs> With Expo on the horizon, the renewal of the Bund became a priority. Once known for its beauty, the whole area was in dire need of a facelift. And in typical Chinese style, Shanghai's city planners dared to dream the impossible. They made plans to use China's largest boring machine to create a three-kilometer-long, two-story tunnel underneath the Bund. They masterminded the removal and replacement of an entire 1,000-ton bridge. They envisaged the use of the reclaimed traffic lanes as a landscaped area and they began refurbishing over 25 historic buildings. To achieve this, they set aside 40 billion US dollars. There was only one problem. By the time the necessary groundwork was completed, there was less than a year left to deliver these towering ambitions. We follow the teams facing this impossible challenge. Have the planners been too ambitious? With high expectations, tight deadlines, and a unique history to uphold, can these teams really meet their deadlines and be ready for a May opening of World Expo? In August 2007, preliminary work on the tunnel that would divert traffic off the Bund began as China's largest boring machine arrived. Taking over a year to assemble, it's finally ready to go in January 2009. This tunnel boring machine, named Tongtai, has a massive diameter of 14.27 meters. 
Its task, to dig a three kilometer long, 13.95 meter wide tunnel under the Bund so that five entire lanes of traffic can disappear underground, freeing a huge amount of space on the surface. As they begin their project, one single challenge looms largest. But historic buildings are not the team's only problem. The Waibaidu Bridge, linking the Bund to the space-aged Pudong side, is also right above the tunnel. If they don't get it right, the bridge could collapse. The bridge is the gateway to Shanghai's historic Bund. Traditionally known as Lover's Walk, the Bund, or embankment, runs alongside the Hongpu River. It became a thriving British settlement during the First Opium War in 1842, when Britons were given the right to reside in Shanghai. Their official status ended a period of Wild West lawlessness and initiated a new prosperity for Shanghai, with the Bund at the heart of this developing international hub. The Waibaidu Bridge soon became the main transport artery, connecting the Bund and Huangpu district to the Hongkou district. And the bridge still plays a crucial role in today's Shanghai. Um, this is Will the tunnel engineers manage to save the bridge from the impact of the boring machine? Why Baidu Bridge is just part of the $40 billion refurbishment of the Bund envisaged by Professor Wu Jiang from Shanghai's Tongji University. In 2007, he suggested an international urban landscaping competition to design an area where Shanghai's residents could enjoy anything from quiet contemplation to rollerblading. In March 2007, Shanghai invited 10 international firms to create a master plan for the redevelopment of the historic waterfront. The winning design was submitted by Harvard professor Alex Krieger's firm, CKS. But in order to make the waterfront a reality, the Bund's promenade would need to close for 33 months enabling engineers to tunnel underneath it before the landscapers even start. The surface work will be done in just 11 months. 400 people will work flat out on this $15 million project. Engineer Li Min is in charge of the site, but is daunted by the size of the project. Her sentiments are echoed by her colleague, Mr. Chang. Brought in to help later, he has worse problems. His site is littered with underground pipes, which need to be cleared before he can even start. While Li Min has 11 months to complete a project that should take one and a half years, Engineer Chang, in charge of the rest of the site, cannot even start some of the work he must do until the month before the site needs to be opened. Originally intended to be 30 feet wide, 
A 60-foot-wide granite walkway was eventually built in 1856. Then, in 1920, the local council widened the Bund Esplanade to 120 feet, incorporating a tramway, traffic lanes, and a new lawn exclusively for foreigners. Li Min and Mr. Chang will more than double this stunning promenade. And as the landscaping and tunnel projects proceed apace, across the road at the former British consulate, now known as Bund 33, the team is struggling to balance the needs of the historic site with the desperate time pressure. Ling Ying Song and Cho Hong are the architects responsible for its renovation and restoration. The original British consulate at Bund 33, built in 1852, burnt down in 1870. The present building opened three years later. Like all the buildings on the Bund, this effectively floats on a sea of mud with the ground floor expected to settle almost half a meter. Two years ago, the Chinese government, who now own the building, developed plans to turn it into an exhibition space for the World Expo and a potential museum. The restoration process is highly specialized and painstaking work. For Bund 33, the project will take 18 months and cover a total floor area of 6,000 square meters. The foundations are just one of the challenges Ling and Cho must face. Working with design restoration specialists and one of China's top horticulturists, they have to fit 21st century features into a 19th century building. Yuanlanzu with historical, technological, and timing challenges ahead. Can these teams really pull off the impossible and be ready for the opening of Expo in May? On Shanghai's waterfront, a transformation is underway. The city is expecting 70 million visitors for World Expo. And a huge amount of work has to be completed in time. But the Bund is more than a temporary tourist attraction. Starting life as a CD trading hub with opium its prime commodity, the Bund became a world-class banking center, dominating Eastern finance for almost a century. Between 1847 and 1927, 35 foreign banks opened key operations here. Modern global giant HSBC was one of these. Opening on the 4th of March, 1865, it heralded the start of a banking explosion and catapulted the Bund to global financial stardom. So the events leading up to the founding of the bank unfolded over a about a year. It started in 1864 when a ship arrived in Hong Kong bearing the rumor that a, a bank was going to be started in India but a bank of China. Um, now when Thomas Sutherland heard this rumor he immediately went home and he drew up a prospectus for a local bank based in Hong Kong and Shanghai. By March the 3rd 1865 they opened the very first branch for business Founded as the first bank to serve Hong Kong and Shanghai's local and international communities, HSBC was soon thriving. 
The Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank had to open on the Bund in Shanghai. It was the place to be. It was where all the foreign agencies, all the foreign merchants, um, all had their warehouses, their go-downs, their offices. They were all on the Bund. The Bund had become so important that when HSBC outgrew its first HQ, it opened its new offices on the same spot. Just a few doors down from HSBC's original Shanghai HQ on the Bund, a team of architects, designers, artisans and construction workers are coming face to face with the Bund's colonial past. Here, architects Ling and Cho are getting to grips with their biggest problem. How to balance the needs of the modern era with the integrity of one of the Bund's most historic buildings, the former British consulate. While outside, a different kind of team gets to work. Within the compound of Bund 33, there's a huge garden housing 27 state-protected trees that have been here since the consulate was first built. And just like the building itself, the trees are in need of help. And so a specialist tree doctor has been called in to check on their condition. We Trees have been venerated throughout China's long civilization, with different trees signifying everything from longevity to courage and even money. So to the Chinese, this work is critical. But the gardens at Bun 33 are not the only part of the project in need of specialist help. Award-winning conservation expert Filippo Gabbiani, chief architect of Kokai Studios, will oversee the interior design at Bund 33. Being architects that we make both architecture, renovations and new buildings, for us it's very, very difficult to make architectural restoration because it's the most difficult task in architecture. Because as architect you really have to put your ego and your vision aside and to adapt yourself to the building. To Filippo and his team, conserving the integrity of Bund 33 is the greatest challenge. And this historic building is in good company. The Bund thrived throughout the rest of the 19th century and well into the 20th, with dozens of buildings still standing which are world famous as architectural treasures. Across the river, engineers Qi Chiang and Hao Yan whose two-story tunnel will divert traffic off the Bund, are about to pay a visit to one of the last buildings to be constructed during this heyday. The Broadway Mansions, then the tallest building in the city, opened in 1934. Its 99 apartments were laid out as bachelor pads, each comprising a sitting room with recessed fold-up bed. Today, Broadway Mansions has been restored as a luxury hotel, and the engineers need to have a difficult conversation with its managers. This building But for Qi Chiang, it's not just his professional reputation at stake, but something far more personal. 
，呃，主要是我外公年轻时候呢，他也参与了这个设计，他主要是负责上海大厦这个装机组的一个设计的。我想从我们私人感情来讲，我我自己也要尽我的最大努力来保留它。But a huge engineering challenge soon becomes the chief focus. Because it's too weak to withstand the tunneling below, the historic Waibaidu Bridge needs to be moved, reinforced, and replaced. Enter geomatics expert Duncan Lees, whose precise measurement system will show the engineers exactly what they're up against. Geomatics engineering combines precise measurement with 3D modeling and analysis. At the heart of the technique is accurate information. What we're doing here is collecting enough scanner setup so that we can model the bridge, provide a pre precise engineering structural model of the bridge. There's a lot going on around here. We need to understand the complexity of all the work that's going on. The bridge is a fundamental part of that. So we have to scan plenty of setups to get that information so we can model it. What we do now is move the scanner onto the next position and then put the camera, the photographic camera, onto the same position that the scanner was. The geomatics team will also look at another problem. The tunnel is due to pass under a number of key historic sites, and the pair must make sure these are kept safe. Have you pinged all the targets? Yeah, I think we've got everything on the targets. I was just wondering whether they finished this. It's slightly better fitted out, this one up here, than downstairs. They must have. Must it looks be. much more finished than I thought it would, actually. It's, um, yeah, it's all looking really impressive. Very impressive, actually. The team are taking precise snapshots of the tunnel from every angle, which will piece together as a whole picture. When the data is complete, Duncan will use a sophisticated computer program to create final 2D and 3D models. And while Chi Chiang and his team get to grips with information delivered from the very latest technology, Li Min and her team are facing a much more low-tech challenge. Pressure on the team is mounting fast, and her colleague, engineer Cheng, calls an emergency meeting. The most important holiday in China, Chinese New Year runs over 15 days and symbolizes both the beginning of the year and a time to be with family. But for the team, this causes a big problem. No workers for more than two weeks. With an entire bridge to move, foundations of historic buildings under threat, rain, and an upcoming holiday stopping work just when every second counts, things don't look good for the fast approaching deadlines on China's Wall Street. Restoring the Bund is not just about history and reviving a decayed quarter of Shanghai. The Bund is being primed for a new role on the world stage, and it's one that looks set to outshine even its past glories. In order to be ready to host the World Expo, the historic Bund is undergoing a miraculous transformation. Three teams are working day and often night to ensure that everything is ready in time. Here, a team of tunnelers is moving heaven and earth to create a tunnel under the famous road, which landscapers can transform into a riverside idyll, fitting for this 21st century financial powerhouse. Already successfully navigating the foundations of a number of historic buildings, the tunnel engineers now have another problem. They need to replace 800 rotting piles, which form the foundations of the Waibaidu Bridge, with 12 giant concrete pillars. So the team has come up with a radical solution. 
they've decided to move the bridge. To do this, they've cut it in two, placing each 500-ton section onto a barge, letting it drift 4.7 kilometers upstream to Minshanglu port, where the bridge has been reinforced completely before being brought back. The project has taken upwards of 2,000 men, who added new beams and steel supports, while also changing the materials of the bridge surface. Professor Wu Jiang from Tongji University spearheaded the original team tasked with planning this Bun transformation. And he has intimate knowledge of this extraordinary event. After 10 long months of work, the bridge is finally ready to go back. And as the bridge is being placed onto its newly reinforced foundations, a few meters from its southern tip, the pace of work at Bund 33, the former British consulate, is gathering speed. One of the highlights of the Bund 33 preservation effort is the unique Grand Staircase. This Beyond the preservation of irreplaceable features like the staircase, the team is also trying to restore elements of the site which have all but disappeared. Working seven days a week, from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., the team are living on site, determined to finish on time. Back at the tunnel site, work continues 24-7. But the problem the engineers are facing now isn't technical, it's human. And it's above ground. The construction site is in a residential area, and the residents are not happy. Ji Chang is dealing with public pressure less than five minutes from the Art Deco Hotel Broadway Mansions, built by his own grandfather during the Bund's heyday. At its height, the Bund symbolized the wealth and power of colonial China. It also had a darker side. Sustained wealth gave way to opulence in what soon became known as the Paris of the Orient. But with the hedonism of the 30s and 40s long gone, what does the future hold for the Bund? Can it recapture its glory days? We're about to find out.
With less than 30 days to go before the official opening, things are heating up at the waterfront area. On patrol again, engineer Chang is not happy with the finish of the newly reinforced 2600 meter cement wall. <laughs> In the end, there's no choice. The markings on the entire wall have to be removed and the wall recoated. Meanwhile, underground, the engineering team has successfully moved and replaced a bridge and built a 3.3 kilometer long tunnel from boring the hole to completion in just 14 months. The team has safely avoided the foundations of a number of historical buildings, but now faces yet another huge challenge. This is Shanghai Metro Line, one of the world's busiest subways. But unknown to the 700,000 daily commuters, something above them, just 1.4 meters away, is potentially a great danger. With so much at stake, any mistakes in the tunnel will cripple the entire subway system. In order to be ready to host World Expo, the historic Bund is undergoing a miraculous transformation. Three teams, architects, tunnelers, and landscapers are working day and often night to ensure that the waterfront is ready in time, with tempers running high and sleep increasingly a luxury. But the Bund's revival runs much deeper than the need to accommodate a six-month-long expo. After the Communist Party swept to victory in 1949, the Bund, as a prime symbol of Western decadence within China's own borders, became a ghost town and lay all but derelict. <laughs> Then, in 1992, Chairman Tang Xiaoping made an important announcement. In his words, Shanghai will be the head of the dragon pulling the country into the future. It was only natural that the Bund, the former heart of corporate Shanghai, should take its rightful place at the center of the city's aspirations. But was it viable to revive the Bund as China's Wall Street, or had the world forgotten Shanghai? Center stage on an ambitious and very 21st century project, the team tunneling underneath the Bund are about to tackle an unprecedented feat. Part of the tunnel lies just 1.4 meters above this major metro line, and digging above it will cause the tunnel to float upwards. Again, the team solves this problem with engineering flair. With very little margin for error, the team has decided to dig section by section, adding weight as they go, then taking it away. This allows them to keep a precise weight between 10 to 15 tons on each section of the tunnel at all times. And as the tunneling team surmount this truly monumental challenge, 
At Bund 33, intense rescue work continues in the garden. Diagnosis is just the first step. What follows is an elaborate process of tree rescue work, a process that involves identifying dead wood and looking for decay or cavities, as well as insect infestation. It's a unique and highly skilled method of creating fake stems to support weak branches that will, over the years, be blended into the living tree. And while working in the grounds of the former British consulate is measured, inside the building it's a different story. The pressure is on and everyone is rushing to complete their jobs, including the very delicate operation of laying floor tiles, which are based on the original design. And as moving heavy air conditioning equipment across newly laid tiles is causing blood to boil, Hao Lian and Qi Chiang are buoyant. They've managed to move, reinforce and replace a 1,000-ton bridge and have tunneled underneath the Bund, successfully avoiding damage to the adjacent metro, utilities pipes and the foundations of several historic buildings. But with just one day to go before inspection, they still have the huge task of clearing the entire area and laying the tarmac road. And all their triumphs will count for little if they fail to pass their inspection. Chi Chien is on his way to meet scanning specialist Duncan Lees to find out how well his tunnel measures up. Hi. Morning. How are you? This is uh, the laser scanner that we were telling you about. Uh, we've been using it to collect all of the measurement information on the tunnel so that we can look at the geometry of the measurements, how accurate uh, the, measure the tunnel is. And I can show you some of the data. This is the scan control window. We use this to set um, how we're going to take the scans. Um, we can set how far apart the points are that we're going to measure on the tunnel. And because the laser scanner can collect so many, um, it's a much more complete uh, data set for, for, the, for the whole of the geometry of the tunnel. This is a crucial moment for the team. Waiting for the motor. It is a, a fantastic piece of engineering. It's been a, 
very enlightening to be down here working. You know, the, the quality of the build, the way everything is set out, all of the engineering, everything is in the right place. You know, there's nothing that we've, we've looked at today that, uh, that points to any irregularities, any problems with the build at all. It's uh, a an very impressive structure. But after such resounding praise, the team is in for a come down. Puddles of water on the ground mean they cannot perform their final task to lay the tarmac until these have been cleared. With this unexpected delay, will Chi Zhang and his team be on track with their schedule? Meanwhile, on the waterfront area above the tunnel, they're also running out of time with many final touches still needed. Engineer Cheng calls yet another emergency meeting. While at the Bun 33 designer's office, chaos is also reigning. With less than a month to go before opening, the team has just been asked to construct a lift. It's perfect to put the lift here, so we protect the rest of the original structure to be penetrated by a new lift. We raise a volume that there was all these technical volumes of backlash behind to bring back this grandeur of place, and then, and now the client instead want to, to, to make a shaft again. It's, uh, it's not, it's, it's not working. The lift is a very important upgrade in this building, and it's a, something that we cannot give up to have today, like to have toilet size that are suitable for modern use, as to have air conditioning, as to have heating system that are, can guarantee a modern comfort, comfort of life. But these are big issues in these kind of projects because the building themselves were not built and designed with materials that could resist to these thermal shocks. Well, this building, particularly, is designed uh, with wooden structures. With air conditioning and heating, you can have dramatic cracks on the wood that they never experienced for 100 years, these kind of thermal shocks. And the most of the most precious details can be lost. One of the major concerns is how to adapt a house from the 1870s to cope with the technical requirements of the 21st century. If they don't get it right, they'll submit the building to cracking caused by rapid temperature changes. OK, so it's a quite a mission impossible, but we have to do it. OK send out directly to subcontract all these commands, yeah. send a letter directly to the project manager about the foundation, okay. and, and let's make it done. Yes. Hmm? Fast. Both for fast. the lift <laughs> and both also for the aircon. Yes. And let's hide them in the most uh, beautiful way, in mm -hmm. this garden for you. Huh? Okay. Okay. Cool. okay. Take this. Take this. Okay. Okay. Bye. With a new lift just ordered, puddles in the tunnel and whole swathes of landscaping to redo, do the teams now have any hope of meeting the Bund's stringent deadlines? In order to be ready to host the World Expo, Shanghai's planners have embraced Chairman Deng's dream to turn the Bund back into China's Wall Street. But with a number of ambitious projects to complete, it's now far from certain that the city will be ready in time. For the tunnel and landscaping teams, they have just one day left until their final inspections, ahead of the opening of both the tunnel and the landscaped area above it. And here on the waterfront, the two kilometer long fence is about to come down. <laughs> 这个横杆去掉的时候，因为这个横杆是固定在这个块这块石块上的，这块立党拿掉以后的吧，这块上下面的四块石头可能会一块带出来。On the run up towards final inspection, engineer Chang notices that something is not right. There are spills, oil stains and marks all over the pristine pavement. They'll have to be cleaned. 
Desperate measures are needed, so he calls for help. With less than 24 hours to go before the opening, the fire department of Shanghai is mobilized to clean the entire 2,000 meter stretch of the Bund. While just a few blocks down, at Bund 33, workers are rushing to install the lift. Unlike the tunnel and landscaping teams, they have one more week to finish. But with more than 100 workers working round the clock, time is still too tight. Back at the tunnel site, it's a last minute race to finish, but there's a big delay to the schedule. The tunnel team has been waiting for over five hours for the tarmac lane to begin, and tempers are fraying. It's midnight, and Hao Liang is badly behind schedule. The six trucks eventually arrive, and the road crews immediately start laying the tarmac. With over 3,000 meters of tarmac to lay before 6 a.m., the workers are pushing ahead full steam to make up for lost time. It took them all night, but the tunnel team has made their deadline. Night falls, and with only eight hours before the official opening, the mad rush to remove the fence and lay the tiles begins. And against what at one time looked like insurmountable odds, the landscaping team will also manage to finish on time. It's the dawn of March 28, the official handing over day for the tunnel and waterfront project. Minutes before the official ceremony of the tunnel, workers are still hectically completing the final touches. It's 30 minutes before the official ceremony for the opening of the tunnel and waterfront projects. After two years of planning and 12 months of intense work, it all boils down to this moment. Shanghai's top government officials and local celebrities are all gathered. Will the team's hard work be considered a success? The answer is yes. With part of the challenge successfully completed, the pressure is now on at Bund 33. Standing near the original HSBC, AIA and standard chartered buildings, it will take center stage on China's Wall Street as part of Shanghai's rising banking sector, whose stock exchange has eclipsed Hong Kong's and even Tokyo's.
I would say Shanghai has got the potential, it has got the ingredients to become the Wall Street of the East. Uh, it's a thriving commercial centre and Shanghai has an ambition to build itself into a world financial centre by 2020. If you look at the economy as a whole, China is today the world's second largest economy. It's growing at an average of more than 10% for the last um, 30 years or so. So obviously a hugely thriving economy. And for us as a bank, it's a very important market. And the science of the banking world gives Shanghai its resounding support as the Eastern financial powerhouse. Nearby, Bund 33 will soon be ready to receive its first guest.建筑师以来第一次接到的一个建筑师以来第一次接到的一个建筑师以来第一次接到的一个建筑师以来第一次接到的一个建筑师以来第一次接到的一个建筑师以来第一次接到的一个建筑师以来第一次接到的一个建